Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is season six. We have just wrapped up season five. Season five was leadership, culture, and change, which is super nebulous. It's very much like up in the air of, of you should be a good leader. We wanted to provide a bunch of tactical examples. And so we got into crucial conversations. We got into um, doing a 360 review of, of your, your, your leadership from your team. We got into some self-development, some books. Um, I think we could have done a little bit more on on implementing change, but we can talk about that in in season six as well with with growth as well. Um, this season is co-hosted by the one and only Dr. George Hariri. George, how are you doing, dude? I'm excited. I'm super excited for the season. I'm gonna forget about the fact that you just introduced me as the one and only. The one and only, not my thing. Yeah. No? Okay. Uh, I don't know why. It just you know we're. This is George and Richard. This is like the OG team. Okay. You know, it's uh I'm excited and oh man, I'm so excited to do a season with you again. It's been how long? A year and a half? Yeah, I mean cuz like season 2 was the last thing we actually did together truly. Well, I think 4, didn't we do part of 4 together? Uh we did some of case acceptance together, but it wasn't really that It wasn't really a joint It wasn't venture. like a full season of me and you. Yeah, I yeah. know. Season 2 was really And even season 2 you checked out at the end. Yeah, I checked out and then season 3 it was like all, all you. Yeah, that well, that didn't happen. Yeah. We went 2 4. Right. Yeah. 5 now 6. Right. So, <laughs> uh so I want to start off with this question which oh. is if someone how does someone know if they should grow their practice? So I want to take a step back from that. Good. I think we missed a huge thing in season two, vision. Okay. We didn't spend- I thought we tried. We tried. We we sort of had like a makeup episode, like practice selection was sort of like this vision thing. Okay. But even me walking into my practice, I had the wrong, I did not know myself well enough to have good vision. Of well, me. your vision is going to change. It's going to change. Sure. But I didn't even think about its importance. I just, mm. you know, and I think we teach so much of by the right practice and like people take that as the practice that cash flows on paper. When I think the more we've done this, the more we've seen it's really the practice that fits your vision long term. So pre-ownership, that's when this, that question that you just asked me, that starts pre-ownership of what do I want from my practice? What do I want from my life? Like we talked about last episode with Mel Robbins, what kind of things give me energy and ownership? You know, and then if if you're, and then that's when, do I need to grow or not? Right. You know, like I want, let's just say, what are your goals, right? That, that age old question, anything you want in life, nothing off the table. Like, what do you want from your practice, from your life, all of those things? Does that require growth? And it depends. It depends. And, and so th- this goes back to how we're framing the models, the the two main models that we see yeah. in dentistry, um, which is productive solo mm-hmm. and profitable group. Yeah. And not group as in multi-practice. We're talking about multiple doctors in one practice. Correct. So, and and you, you are, I have accused you off air of bias, biasing our audience towards profitable group. And so I think there are, there's a whole this I, I think this question is as fundamental uh, uh, as the question in season one of should I be a practice owner? Yeah. And the next question that we didn't know to ask is what kind of practice owner do I want to be? Totally. We missed that. We missed that. So the next question is, do I want to be the main producer? Do do I want to be the show? Is it the George show? Is it the Richard show where, you know, Dr. Lowe shows up, does the dentistry, crushes it? and And it's your thing and you're producing to the maximal ability. You know, you're, you're, you're doing the kind of dentistry that you want in the kind of office that you want. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to this. There's, there's a lot of good things, um, about having a smaller team, about keeping your overhead low. Um, if you actually love dentistry and you don't love management and meetings and systems, and you don't want to have to scale and worry about, other dentists quality of work and hiring people or bringing on a partner or all of those other things that you, you might have to do to, to, to scale and to grow. I, I still think this should be the default that, that most people, George is rolling his eyes at me. I'm not rolling my eyes at you, Richard. I'm like, can I just, (laughs) I, so here's my thing. 
first of all, I feel like it can be your show regardless of the model. I think my practice is very much my show. Okay, sorry. But I'm not there. You know what I mean? So I I don't want that to be like the... No, I didn't mean it in that way. I meant it as like the the, perception of your patients. Patients, yeah, totally. From the patient's perspective, yeah, like they don't know me. It is not the the George show. Yeah, that is... I I get mad when I get requested. Yeah. But from... (laughs) (laughs) I want Dr. Hurry to do my dentistry. Fine. No, it's it's my my staff knows I I hate it. Because then I have to make sure that I'm there for that patient. Right. Very annoying. Um, but <laughs> anyway, so if you've listened to this show and you're on like episode 105 of the shared practices podcast, you can't tell me that's a solo bias. What do you mean? Like somebody who's listened to this show for that long. Yeah. They're probably not. You know what I mean? Like, no, they're, they're a group bias. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in the you, world you, of dentists... You biased our show. No, no. In the world of dentists, and I think what you said was perfect, if meetings and systems right. and running your practice well and staff crying in your office and hiring and firing, and if those things excite you, then group is a model that more favors those things because you get more of that. If clinical dentistry and doing big cases and you know, getting to know your patients and having the relationship and just a small knit team with great culture and just doing dentistry. Like if it's more clinical excitement from ownership, yeah, then you're probably more a solo. I think that's more dentists. I think most people... Well, why does it matter? Because just like... So I think there was a, a wave of us, you and I included, mm-hmm. who built up multi-practice ownership in our heads. Sure. As like the thing. Yeah. Um. And, and so, but then you get to that point and you realize, oh crap, this might not be the thing. Um, this is now multiple overheads, uh, larger teams. It's much harder to lead multiple locations than it is to lead a single location. Um, and the profitability of it's questionable. Right. So yeah. th- there's a lot of question marks there um, that if you've realized, and, and, and the plays with multi-practice ownership are... Um, tend towards the like build them up, bundle them up, uh, sell them off, sell yeah. them off, private equity, all of that, which, which can work and can be fine if that's what you're, if you're into It's that. a wealth game. It's not a income game. It's not a happiness game. It's just wealth. Right. Yeah. So I also think there's some downsides to that. So sure. I, I think that a lot of people hear what you've done with your practice and they think they want that. And in reality, they they might actually really enjoy dentistry and hate management. Well, yeah, if you hate management, then right. But but a lot of people are listening as a pre-owner. A lot of people are listening not having done it. And they think that they want to own a practice and they want to be the leader. And when they get to it, they realize, you know what? Actually, that stuff's my least favorite. And just seeing patients and doing awesome cases is my favorite. And some people love both. Some people love the management and they love the clinical dentistry. Um, but, but I think there's a, there's a scale. There's like the people who don't like it enough that they should never be practice owners. There's the people who do it because it's worth it, but it doesn't energize them. It's a, it's a high cost. The, the managing people side of things yeah. is worth it, but takes a toll. Like day in, day out, they stress out over convers- difficult conversations they're going to have with, with team members they procrastinate. They let stuff slide. Um, and and from coaching people, you've seen that this is, this is what we all struggle with. Even those who, of us who seem like we have our crap together and are doing it really well, still, it's still difficult to do as we oh, talked yeah, about on, absolutely. This, on this last episode. So I still think that doing the dentistry yourself and managing a small team is the quickest route to a very profitable income as, as an owner. I don't think anybody's arguing with you there. Right. Solo practice, most straightforward, easiest to do, most predictable income, least amount of risk. And the least amount of growth required. Least amount of growth required and least amount of marketing, least amount of everything that is unpredictable and stressful. Nobody's arguing with you there. <laughs> but I don't think we've said that enough. Potentially, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but So I, so I want to say it. No, cool. And I'm with you on that point. Okay. I think the thing is, I think our mission at Shared Practices is always both income and happiness. Right. And that happiness piece, 
I don't think is, it's not in group or solo. It's in the right model for you, the listener, you, the dentist. And it's not, right? George has a bias and George does not hide it. No. Nor would I ever want to. No. But as a listener, it's not do what George does. It's George is this guy who is this way that his personality just happens to really favor group practice ownership. Right. So that's him. But I think the things I would take away from that is he knows himself well. Right. And I'm talking to myself in the third person. It's kind of weird. It's, just, it's good. Yeah. I like it. But he also, you know, shifted his practice. I, I walked into practice ownership. I, you know, I hired Justin Short for the purpose of being a solo practice owner. Yeah. I was not planning on being a group practice owner at all. So this is another thing to, to talk about. This is um, a model that we all were very exposed to, which was... Um, yeah, the the three day, you know, the the best way to be the most profitable dentist is lean and mean practice, cut down the number of days, and the smallest team possible. Um, that is a way to do very well. Yeah, and financially, like you just said, right, the most straightforward path to a great income is solo practice ownership. I will never argue with that statement. The most straightforward path to a great income is solo practice ownership. And we're talking 500K a year. Like that, I think, is sort of the, for me, that's that's when good dentist money, that's that kind of the, the number I always use. Yeah. And so, sure, I think we're both there. So I hit that point, and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I just, I did all the steps. I did what I was supposed to do. I'm making this good money. And I'm like, but I'm miserable. And so that was where we added happiness, sustainability, and that's where, for a lot of our listeners, they're listening to the show for 100 hours consecutively. Maybe that's not enough for, that's not a big enough challenge. That's not enough fun. That's not enough management. That's not enough of them getting to use the skills they have. And when group practices, and maybe this is where you maybe hopefully would agree with me, that when group practice is done well, the ceiling is higher. Yes, your income as a group practice owner when done well is higher than it would be as a solo practice owner. Your wealth accumulation, the value of your practice, the passive income, all of like, so I would, I almost view it as levels, you know, and I think we've, we've done a very poor job of showing them as a continuum. Right. And so I'm actually building, I haven't actually talked about it on this show. I talked about it on the other show, but analytics based practice management is a course I'm building. And it's more about the continuum of you can be a solo than a productive solo then you transition to a group, and then you have a profitable group. That's a, you know, I very much rode the whole spectrum. I bought a practice doing $1 million a year, like really much on the nose. That's a solo office. It right. looked like a group, had two dentists, you know, eight ops, the whole thing. But it took me a year to realize that I really just bought a solo office. Mm. And it just was like, had the staff of a group. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it had all of the... It had uh, all the, it like looked like a group, smelled like a group, but it wasn't a group. You, you got to work your butt off and you have high overhead. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> an ideal scenario. Um, but then we became a group. And so I've experienced both models. And, you know, I can, I can say with a lot of certainty that, yeah, solo is amazing for the right person. Right. If you're content and if you want work to be a small part of your life, I could go to the office, I do my thing, but I got other stuff that keeps me going and keeps me excited and keeps me motivated, not practice ownership. Maybe it's clinical dentistry, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's kids, maybe it's golf, I don't know. But if like you're not the person that thinks about your practice a lot and you know wants it to be the best thing ever or whatever, then yeah, you're, I mean, there's a lot of people, that's the majority of people. They're not freaks like us, you know, but- there's also that person that keeps listening and they've been listening for years. And I don't know. I just think that there's a large part of our audience that they want that challenge. They want that peak experience. And I almost feel like it's level one is like the average dentist making, you know, revenue of 700K is a national average. And they have an income of like 160, 180, 190, whatever it is. That's like average. That's level one. You know, level two is lean and mean stuff, right? You cut your overhead, you do a little bit more than 700, maybe hit a million, you have lower overhead. That's like level two. And then level three is that, you know, you kind of break down level two and then you go to delegating, growing associate, group practice. I feel like that's sort of the levels and you can you can go to level two and then decide if you want level three. And I think that's the, um, for me, I think 
the thing that I've been realizing in a lot of our clients are those level twos going to level threes. And, and you know, there, there are two ways to grow. One is you can grow by buying another practice. Mm-hmm. You can grow by growing your own practice. You can also do a merger. Yeah, um, or you could do both simultaneously, right? You can do all the above. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that is hardest about multi-practice and the, the, we're talking about growth so you know a lot of i think that was the default that we all assumed was like okay you get your first practice going really well and then you buy another and then you buy another yeah. buy another um it's it's really hard to lead an office when you're not there i've said this a lot on the show yeah um but uh you're not doing the work you're not the one seeing the patients doing the dentistry and you never really were a lot of times if if it's a practice that you've never been the primary producer in. Um, and so the team doesn't know you super well. The associate you know, doesn't interact with you a ton. Um, it, it becomes about, you know, running a business with another layer on top of the practices. And um, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of uh, things that go wrong at each practice uh, and, and a lot of things that can occur with each team member and you add that across multiple practices and it all scales up and all of the difficulties like the snake in the practice and the the thing that flooded and and this is all stuff that's happened the last week snake yeah snake two two snakes an actual animal animal snake in your practice yeah. We won't get into it because you don't like to. I don't want to. Yeah. Into no. No. Stuff. I, yeah. yeah. No. In, in one of the practices, that's just odd. There, plumbing like flooding, snake like there's there's been so. <laughs> but like, let's take a step back because just like your multi practice experience, I don't think it's super relatable to our audience in a lot of ways. Sure. Because not a lot of people go from zero practices to three practices overnight. Right. Like so, the more typical track for somebody to get in the multi practice is at a second. Yeah. And so I had this guest on Practice Underwater. Her name was Sarah. This is probably going to come up a lot in season six, but is it cool if I like tell a story about a previous Practice Underwater guest? Sure. Anyway, because, you know, anyway. George, Matt, and I looked at each other the other day and we admitted to each other that we don't listen to every episode of each other's stuff. So <laughs> this is probably essential. Fill so me in on an episode that I missed Sarah out. Sarah actually is, we've had her on twice now. And so you'll, if I tell you her name off air, you'll know who she is. She's very involved in our mastermind groups. Okay. But so she is. Her she's super successful startup, extremely successful, and she's doing really well solo doc in her own office. And she's like, okay, I'm killing it, crushing it, making great money at the first location. Let me look for the second, and that's that next step that everyone makes. But when you really digest it, why is she doing well? Because treatment planning, diagnosis, case acceptance are super solid. Because she's doing it all. She's doing it all. Yeah. The next step is owning a second practice in a lot of doctors' minds. Yeah. And the problem is you're just going from like level two to level five. Right. You know, I would like to see more of those docs, and this is what I told her, take a minute and make your practice less dependent on you. And right. that's what you're saying. You're like, well, multi-practice is super challenging. Well, yeah, because you you missed a step. You missed having a solo successful practice where you work on culture. Then you missed taking yourself out of that practice and then have culture still stay then you go by the additional location and then work on the culture and all of that yeah. there which is which is going to be harder like yeah. you, like you said it's the next level up because you're like not you're skipping two or three steps right and so i think the most typical track for multi practice ownership is one i'm actually against where you have a like oh gosh i hate this piece of advice it's you know you have a practice doing a million dollars at 50% overhead that means you know how to run a practice well enough to go by a second i've heard that more times than I can count. Those skills are completely separate. You have yet to hire an associate. You have yet to employ an office manager. You have yet to run HR. You have yet to keep culture while you're not there. You've never done any of those things under your first roof. Right. Go do them in three more roofs. Right. Before you've even done it in one. Doesn't make sense. I can tell you, right, this is and ask me how I know, when you do all those things in your own roof, where you have great culture and things are going well, things break. Then you get better. Then you move and you improve. Then you feel like I, I've put down multi-practice ownership, but you know, I don't know. You've gone back and forth so many times. I've gone back and forth, but I officially, I think I've, I've officially put it down. Okay. Um, but for, as of August of 2020. So if you're listening to this in three years and you're like, George, and I, George you have, has six practices, you have then five it's like, practices. What happened? Yeah, no, I, I, I genuinely think I'm putting it down. Um, but four months ago, I had an offer for 
you know, about $2 million for a second practice was going to be at the size of my first practice. And I'm starting there and I was hoping to grow it to five. And, you know, I felt at that point I was finally ready for multi-practice because I, I've, I've, my practice was able to handle removing me from the equation entirely. Mm. So we went from me by myself as the main producer, then me as an, having an associate, then me having an associate who's the main producer, then removing myself from the clinical equation. And now adding a second practice is a lot more like the first I currently operate. I'm not there. I have to run things as if I'm not there. I have to do departmental meetings, team leads, systems in place, things ironed in, you know, checking your metrics and KPIs and maintaining culture on a large level. All of those things can be practiced at that first location before you go to the second. Right. And that's what's missed in the whole multi-practice world. You know, they're just like, oh, just go get a second and figure it out on the fly. Well, you know, level three and four are probably still within that first roof of, you know, growth and leadership and all that stuff. And then five is then you have multiple roofs and multiple sets of overhead and all those things. Um, but so and and we've talked about your vision might change multiple times. So, yeah. you know, previously you thought I'm going to own a practice. Then you thought, oh, I'm going to own multiple practices. Then you're like, oh, I'm going to do a group practice. And then you get to group practice. And I know. So my dad's dentist right now. Yeah. Used to have associates. And maybe he didn't do a great job. We don't know. Yeah. But he now is back to him only. And he's like, I I don't want dentistry being done under my roof that like I don't have control over. He's like, it was too yeah. stressful for me. And stuff went wrong. And, you know, maybe he got sued. Maybe, you know, uh, it, his ability to be okay with not everything being perfect that he's not doing wasn't there. Um, so just because you think that you might really enjoy multi-practice ownership, or not multi-practice, but, you know, a, a group practice. Yeah. You might get there and realize, man, this is not what I wanted either. But I guess I feel like the point I was trying to make and I didn't get to was a Sorry. group practice is, in my mind, that middle ground between one and multiple. And You I, get a lot of the same things with multiple, but you have the benefit of only having one. I And I think if people are looking for a healthy source of sustainable income and, and wealth generation you might realize with one group practice, you're like, you know what? I'm kind of good. Yeah. And, and I think that's another big point is that if if you can grow one practice well, you might very quickly realize like, why do I want a second or a third? Yeah, and it's it's just, you know, income in multi-practice. And I, I didn't think we'd be talking so much about multi-practice in this episode, but multi-practice income isn't really a motivator for a lot of people. It's not like the cash flow you get from owning those multiple practices is a big thing. And I think you could, I mean. No, I agree. I 100% agree. Yeah. I think. Um, it's the wealth generation. It's the, I have an asset worth millions of dollars now. Right. And 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 the potential upside for that in whatever yeah. the, the arrangements and deals are down the road. Um, so, but, I, but I, I think this is all a really important discussion to have at the beginning of season six, because the question of whether or not to grow depends on your vision. And I want to I wanna first tell our audience, I encourage everybody to put down whatever notion you have of what's possible and just leave it behind. And ask yourself, how much growth do I want assuming I can have however much I want? I think people are like, oh, I can't double a practice in a year. I can't do this or that. And it's all possible. Hmm. Ask me how I know. You know, it's like you can do whatever you want. Just put down whatever you think is possible and ask yourself what you actually want. That's huge. Yeah. And that's really hard because that also means someone who hasn't grown their practice for three years. Or seven like Albert. <laughs> it's also taking ownership of that. Yeah. Of, of, okay, not that what I've done is wrong or that can't be done. It's that I haven't done it because uh, I'm, I'm holding it back. You have to do something differently. Yeah. And, right, I, I would love to, oh, man. Richard, I'm so excited for this season. Can I rant? Yeah. Do we have anything we have to talk about before I rant for like 10 minutes? No. Cool. I want to introduce the concept that growth is not linear. Okay. Never is. I don't think it ever has been. I don't know why people think that like, oh, 10% a year for the next, like, that. none of that makes sense. I feel like you, and even in shared practices, we've noticed this, where you reach, you know, you sort of have a level where you're, usually you're in plateaus, and then you have like a very short period of a steep incline to the next plateau. And there's always something holding you back from going to that next plateau. And until you figure it out and unlock it, you'll never really grow. And so I find a lot of practices, 
it's very rare that I see somebody steadily growing for like an extended period of time at like a, a, a quick pace. Mm. It's always you like sprint to a level and then you stay there until you're able to get organized, get your infrastructure in place, add capacity, whatever it is that's holding you back from that next level and then go again. And so I would like our audience to think of growth not in the sense of, well, if I'm doing a million this year, then 1.2 in a year seems reasonable, then 1.4 the next year. And it's like, that's not what it is. Right. It's a million unlock buttons, then be doing like a 1.4 pace in a three-month period, then unlock buttons, and then you're doing a you know 1.8 pace, then a two, like, and there's just these thresholds that you reach. And it's not this you know, linear process. It's more along the lines of what is holding me back from busting through my current level or my current plateau and what gets me to the next one and then what's the next one after that? And they're usually in a lot of different areas. Well, and and I also would say that not only is it not linear, one of the things that holds people back is that for a time period, it is definitely not profitable. No, ever. Yeah. So growth is all about deferred profits. And there was, I actually just said this on the other episode of, of a, a episode of, so we did a follow-up on shared practices with uh, James. He was a practice our water guest and then he joined our, joined our coaching and then we had a follow-up with him. And, you know, there's always, so the way I, I kind of outlined it, I don't think I ever explained it on episode. Somebody told me that they really liked that, but it was, you know, first you take on an expense, whether it's a people expense, a marketing expense, usually there's an expense at the beginning of, you have to do something to stimulate, get yourself off of the plateau you're on. Then there's like either an increase in patient flow, an increase in diagnosis, an increase in increase in something. And then as a result, you'll have an increase in treatment planning, an increase in doctor production, and then an increase in collections, and then an increase in profit. And so it takes like a three or four month period from the thing that you did that stimulated the growth until you making more money is happen a result. Right. And 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 you might have to hire more. And you actually people. temporarily lose money yeah. in that process. Yeah. And so it's getting somebody okay with that is very challenging. This also goes back to, and I feel like we touched on this recently somewhere, but um, lifestyle creep uh, with you all talk about this? my spending? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, the fact that I don't spend very much money personally is a very big catalyst to my professional career. For sure. Be- because you can you can dump money into marketing and it's not changing your day-to-day life. It isn't like this like, <gasps> okay, well, this is scary because I can't meet my personal obligations while I'm while I'm growing my practice. Yeah, and, and I'm fortunate to kind of always be in a position where I think I could go a year without any income from my practice at any given time and not really notice. Um, I don't know, like, I, I, probably more, I don't know, more or less. Than, I, I just don't think about it. I don't think about how much money I'm making this month. That's never a thought in my mind. It's always, what does the practice need for it to reach that next level? And whatever it is, I'm doing it. Right. And yeah, I mean, if you're spending, like if, you're, if your income is 15K a month and you're spending 15K a month, yeah, it's very hard to work with that. Yeah. Because where are we going to get that first domino to fall? And then how are you going to handle the temporary income hit before we can start making 18K, 20K, and then we start working up the ladder. Like you have to be willing to take that temporary income hit. And and I think that holds people back because they are not willing to take a temporary income hit or not able to. And even like with our coaching, right? There's a fee with that. Yeah. Like that's a temporary income hit. Yeah. You know, and I I just like can't stand the client that expects on month one to be making more money because they're doing coaching. Right. It's like, no, like you're you're spending to do coaching. You're going to later be very thankful, but not month two. Right. No, that's not the way this works. Right. <laughs> right. You know, and so for us, I think we've had the most successful people that are more willing to take that temporary income hit and your lifestyle has to be under control and your, or your income has to be high enough that. Right. Your, your, one or your, the other. Your income is well past, you know, your lifestyle requirements. So it, it's the chicken or the egg. This also goes back to practice selection. If you yeah. bought a practice that is in that, Four, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars of collections. The the likelihood that you are at this difficult place where you don't have the money needed to grow and also be able to cover your expenses is is a very real possibility. I had this gut wrenching episode of Prax Underwater where I interviewed this guy. I think his name was Kevin. I forgot his fake name. Um, but he <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> No, his fake name was Kevin. I think his oh, okay. fake name. I'm not going to say his real name. Oh, okay. I thought you no. said, I can't remember his fake name. You no, said Kevin. I can't I remember. I think it was Kevin. Okay. But anyway, so he he had this practice and he was making five grand a month 
in his practice. And it was doing like six, seven hundred K. And he's making five grand a month. He, he was taking home five. Oh. And his overhead was just so high because he had these high fixed costs and he sort of cut some staff. So his his practice dipped. Mm. And then he just had no room to work with. And so I'm just like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna break you out of this habit? And so what I ended up suggesting, which I thought was actually pretty cool, was I suggested cutting his marketing budget currently temporarily to like hire additional team and reactivate recall to get like some revenue that way while simultaneously refinancing his note, stretching out the term longer oh, nice. to gain cash flow off of his practice note. And so like you have to be really creative like that, but that's not a situation you want to get in. Like his practice was tanking for like a year. He was making like 10, 12 a month. That was the time to invest the two or three until you're like, now you're making five because you're just, you know, losing revenue a little bit. And so it's those situations of really being able to, you know, not get to that spot where you have no margin. Yeah. Is either through proper practice selection, lifestyle, but I mean, the person that buys that practice doing 20K or 30K a month, it's like, what do we have to work with? We got no investment here. We got no budget to grow this thing. Right. That's hard. That's yeah. going to be a slow grow. And and that's, I mean, that's like the the sweat equity. Like you, this practice becomes your life. If you want to yeah. grow it, like you're there at all hours, you're doing the marketing yourself because you can't afford to hire it out and all this stuff. So, and I thought marketing was this man, my perception of marketing pre and post ownership. I thought marketing was dollars in, patience in, like just a very transactional thing. And I remember you like, I even being, said that on the show, like, oh, it's just dollars in, patients in, you know, no. yeah, which is what you wanted. You just want a it machine to, be. to feed money in that yeah, pops people and out. And it does do that over time. Right. That part, the over time, I missed. So, you know, I've invested and the right thing. over 10 grand a month in marketing since. 2019, January 29th. So it's like almost two years of me spending 10 grand or more a month in marketing every single month for that long. I feel like beginning of 2020, it started paying off. Like a year of doing that. <laughs> and like nobody has the stomach lining for that. 120K. Oh, I spent, I think, 15% of my overhead in 20. So it was more. That was like 225 in 19 Wow. was marketing. So, so th this is so important for people to hear because Growth can be painful. It's on, on a, very expensive. On on many fronts, from the things that you have to do, the conversations you have to have, the investment you have to be willing to make. And I did it in a very wrong way. So can I like roast myself for 15 minutes? Please. So I went to Breakaway and Scott Luna talks about hiring associates. I listened to everything he said and followed none of it. And so, right, I'm creating analytics-based practice management and I'm sort of, I roast myself in the course of like, this is what I should have done and this is what I did. So let me take you back to, so I bought a practice doing about 90K a month. Okay, I'm just going to be honest with numbers here. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, so I, I bought a practice doing 90K a month and we had a super big honeymoon phase, which is that first six months of ownership. You walk in and we just diagnose all this stuff that wasn't getting done. And we had this like really high doctor production months that I thought were sustainable. And so my practice month three, so I bought it doing 90. Month three, we did 158. Yeah. So I'm sitting here three months into practice ownership. I'm a genius. Look at this. Yeah. I mean, maybe not those exact words, but <laughs> some synonym of those words were being said to myself. And, you know, and then it was like, I did that 150 pace for like three straight months. And then I dro drop, dropped to 102. Mm. And then I sort of stayed in that 102 to 110, 115, like really pushing hard for 115 when 150 was feeling easy like six months ago. Yeah. That was... That, that feels bad. Yeah. That was my experience of my first year of ownership was first six months, you're jacking it up to 150, you know, doing it the way you should be. And hindsight 2020, I could have told myself... I, if I had known what I know now and like with clients, we we know now it's not sustainable. Like mm. we knew it was, I should have been able to know it was not sustainable at the time, but we didn't. And so I should have been doing a lot of the things that I had done like a year later at that time when I was cash flow rich and I could have afforded the investment in growth at mm. that time. Because yeah. right, you're making good money. Your expenses haven't hiked up yet. But then I hired a full-time associate and cut back my hours month six. Because mm. I'm like, oh, 
we'll just expand capacity and we're already at this 150 pace and then we'll break through and do do like 160, 170 with an associate and me and then I take some time off, it'd be great. And then now I have, I'm doing 102, working less with a full-time associate, much higher overhead and a much lower margin. And so That's I went- scary. Oh, it was brutal. And now looking back on it, I just totally took the wrong track. If I had- known then what I know now, I would have been like, okay, this isn't sustainable. Ride the wave while you enjoy it. My seller was retiring. I should not have replaced her. I should have worked the whole practice myself until I had the patient flow and the sustainability to my production to then add an associate and then grow that way. That would have been a much more profitable, much less stressful, much less stomach lining gone year of my life. But right. Know then what you wish you had, you know, like learned a lot in that process. And a lot of those lessons have really informed our philosophies and our ways of telling sustainability of production, not just believing the production collections and like really saying, is this sustainable? Is this something that can be maintained long term? And man, I made so many mistakes that, I mean, you're supposed to, when you hire an associate, expand hours, expand capacity, you know, add procedures to your practice and take time off. I, the only one of those I followed is took time off. Hmm. (laughs) I did not add procedures. I did not expand capacity. I I did everything wrong. And I did not have sufficient new patient flow. And it's so, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've made more mistakes in, uh, so actually two years in a week is how long I've owned my practice. Holy cow. And in two years in a week, I feel like I've made more mistakes than most dentists make in 20 years. Interestingly, spending over 200K on marketing last year is not one of those mistakes um hmm. what i spent it on right some of that was yeah but the idea what i had the i was on the right track it just took me a while to learn the ropes of what i needed to do right and our philosophy is so different than others i didn't have and i think part of our and this is you you and i richard really right the conversation that we had a couple months ago where we really looked at shared practices. And I feel like a lot of what we do is things I wish I knew back when I needed them. Right. And I wish I had what we do back then because it would have saved me a lot of, a lot of things. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't smooth, you know, but finally, yeah, we figured it out and, you know, and it's working now, but it wasn't like that for a long time. <laughs> Not at all. It was, we call it the ugly duckling phase. So that period of growth that's very unprofitable, your practice looks extremely ugly on paper and you're going through like an ugly haircut, awkward period, you know, like all that stuff. And it'll eventually look really great. And that was my practice for a long period of time. And my ugly duckling phase was really long and brutal because of how poorly I had managed the whole situation. Well, it was, it was timed with, you know, it was the timing of everything was wrong. It was like you, you, you moved forward and you invested in marketing and you weren't ready for any of it. I shifted gears at like the worst possible time. Right. Right as, right as the practice was about to take a hit down. And yeah, you didn't I, know I that- added a huge expense, huge expenses in the same month that I lost 45K of revenue. Right. <laughs> so, so timing of marketing is a thing. So yes, I think, I think this has been a perfect episode one for season six. Yeah. I, I'd love to have uh, another episode and let me know if you think that you have a better idea of where to go next, but of what are the metrics that someone can use looking at their practice management software, looking at practice by numbers to say, is growth the right next step for me? And is... Well, I feel like that's a vision question. Okay. So we've we've started with that, but okay, now let's say I want to grow based on my vision. Either... Yeah, so if, if for like... Maybe their practice is in a position to grow, but they don't want to for their vision. Then you just cut insurance, mm. right? So it's it has start. Maybe your practice isn't in a it doesn't have like the excess of demand, but your vision supports multiple doctors, and you're the only doctor there. Then you have to grow. Right. That's your vision. Or or you've got a 500k practice that you bought for some reason, and you want to get to 1.2 million or yeah. 1.3. Then you want to grow. Yeah. So I feel like the do I want to grow. That should be answered by this episode, if not maybe another one on vision, but I feel like we've addressed the vision. We, we addressed it. So, yeah. okay, so now I want to grow. What is holding me back, I guess? Love that one. That's, that's yes. the episode we need to have next. And I think 
a 10,000 foot view of a lot of the things, drivers of growth, because ways of growing. Everything. I think most people assume if, if they're having that conversation that it's, it's just marketing. It's just new patients. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is the assumption when we were calling this a marketing season, but calling this a growth season means we're, we should be looking at a lot of things before we just say, let's dump 10 grand on, on the marketing fire and, and see what it does. Well, and I think if you were to think that you could go listen to, so this is coming out, what, two weeks from today? Yeah. Like that. So two weeks ago on Friday, yeah. um, with James, a follow-up on practice underwater, you know, we grew his practice substantially without investing a dollar in marketing. And there's other practices where we, we need to invest a lot in marketing. Right. And it just, it, that's not a cookie cutter thing. That's what the practice needs. Right. And there, you can do it both ways. Growth and marketing are not synonymous. Right. It, marketing is a tool for growth. So maybe maybe next episode is what are the ways you can grow? Yes. What are the tools in the toolbox yeah. if you want to grow your practice? I cool. love that. George, this has been awesome. We should podcast more often. I think we're going to. Yeah. It seems like that. I mean, if we're going to co-host a season, I'd imagine it's going to be more episodes with me and you. Oh, I agree. I, I, I just... Yeah. And I, you know, no you, intro outros? Are we committing to that the entire we, season? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, we can be... We can, we can do some of our outro duties. Like right now, I can say, hey, if you haven't given us a review somewhere give us a review somewhere we're, we're on more platforms i think we're in spotify spotify's been i hitting. know we're in spotify yeah, yeah i didn't know that we're in spotify um i'm trying to get us on on like alexa on amazon alexa so do we have any clue how close we are to a million i think we're five days away oh we're days away from yeah i gotta i gotta look up that number and we're at like 420 ish reviews thank you everyone for have for everyone who's downloaded who's shared it who's yeah, grabbed- when this is released we'll pass a million we'll have passed a million yeah that's true well, congrats. Congrats, man. Yeah. Dude, pound it. Pound it. Wild ride. Yeah. It's crazy. Okay. Off, oh, man. I got a lot to say about that, but I won't. Okay. Cool, man. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it next time. Awesome.